Hi, I'm Greg Pregel. I've been asked to look at Rosalind's monologue from As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 5, and Why I Pray You. First off, let's look at just the play. Let's look at Rosalind, the heroine, the main character. She's in Duke Frederick's court, her uncle's court's tumultuous time, but she sees Orlando wrestle the wrestler Charles, falls madly in love. The next scene, she's banished by Duke Frederick. Her cousin Celia goes with her. They flee into the forest of Arden. They dress up for safety while they're there. Rosalind as Ganymede and Celia as Aliena. Orlando might be killed by his brother Oliver, so he runs into the forest of Arden too. So then he's uh, carving Rosalind's name in trees. He's madly in love. And that's kind of where they meet up again. Celia and Rosalind are seeing this, pulling poems off trees. And so they meet, you know, by happenstance in that scene in act three, scene two. I think that's a really important scene to know and to look at, to go into this. Orlando says, I'm in love. I'm, I'm love shaked, I think is what he says. And he, he, he begs her for help, for remedy. And she, she says, you know what? I've seen this before. Okay. And she goes through, I think her, she opens up her own passion, her own heart and, and kind of, finds her way through it. I think playing Ganymede gives her the freedom to start thinking through her passion and expressing it in her own way. And I think she's discovering along the way how to say this and how to express this because I think she's incredibly smart. She's she's so, so smart. She's probably one of the smartest people in this play. And I think it's it's kind of this balance or or battle sometimes of her intellect and her passion. Either she's afraid or she just doesn't know how to express herself. I think that's something to play with and kind of look at and analyze. And then she's given this opportunity by being this character where she can just kind of let loose. And, and of course, just like any discovery, it's not easy. She kind of fumbles her way along and enjoys the journey. And so she says, okay, so meet me tomorrow morning. I'll give you remedy. I've seen this before. You, you would do really good if, if I just act like I'm this Rosalind and um, that you come every day to woo me. So, so we'll start tomorrow. Okay. So she is free and saying all these passionate things and having fun with it and having fun with him playing this role and playing this scene. And then the next morning he doesn't show up. So I think that leading to him not showing up and then she is pissed, she is disappointed, she's upset and I think she's raw. And then Corin comes in and says, okay, let's go see the shepherd and shepherdess pastoral, right? So we're gonna go and see Silvius who has all this unrequited love for Phoebe. Like we, we, gotta, we gotta go see this. So, so they go to go watch this. So they're watching. And Sylvia says, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, Phoebe. I love you so much. You're the most beautiful thing in the world. And Phoebe's like, I don't want you. Nobody wants you. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're ugly. Like, she just, she doesn't want anything to do with him. So go back to that first scene with Rosalind, with Orlando, with her love, and and playing this game and, and being lifted and lifted and lifted, so much energy, so much happiness, so much fun. And then the next scene, him not showing up, and boom, she hits down and she's so raw. Now she sees somebody else who is giving their love, giving their love, giving their love. And this other person, Phoebe, is just being a Phoebe and she doesn't want anything to do with it. Enter. Rosalind. Let's look at the monologue. I went on YouTube just to kind of see what's the common performance, I guess, for this monologue. Something that stands out immediately is that there's not much energy at the beginning. I, I totally get trying to undercut it, but I think that still needs to be energized. And like I was saying from before, she's so high up living in this world as Ganymede and enjoying it, enjoying how smart she is and, and what she's creating here. And then him not showing up the next day after all that happened. Boom, she's raw. Then seeing somebody who's just pouring their heart out. And then this woman, I mean, it is a little arrogant that 
Rosalind's like, oh, two, a shepherd and a shepherdess, two people like in the country, like they're, they should just be together. He loves her, so she should just love him back. But anyways, so they're watching and she, she should jump in there. Boom. And why? Like that needs to be driven from all of that prior and actually ask the question. And that doesn't mean you need to sit there forever and wait for the response. But if I'm setting up Phoebe and I just, uh, and why I pray you, that I ask the question, do you want a response? I'm not even gonna give you time for a response. Knowing your shifts and your beat changes through this will really help kind of guide my opportunities. What's my strongest choice? And let's go through it kind of line by line here. And, and why, why, and why? I pray you, who might be your mother? And mother being like, if she's a princess or goddess or whatever, like, like, who are you, Phoebe? You, you're no one, you're nothing. That you insult. She's insulting him, exalt, taking all the praise and him putting her on a pedestal and her enjoying it to the heavens. Um, and all at once, all at once she's doing over the wretched, wretched being Sylvia, sorry, Sylvia. What though you have no beauty, hmm? You have no beauty. So enjoying that, as by my faith, I see no more in you than, okay, this line. So sometimes you're gonna, you're gonna get these interpretations or these lines. You have to make the choice because looking into this myself, I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed. One of these translations said, you don't light up the room enough because you have no beauty. What I see without a candle is the dark. I see no more beauty in you than I would see without a candle, which is darkness. Everything may go dark as I'm going to bed. Okay, that makes sense. I see no more beauty in you, which is nothing, than I see without a candle as I'm going to bed in the dark. I see nothing. And must you, again, must you be therefore proud and pitiless? And, and then the shift. Why? What means this? Why do you look on me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. So ordinary. You are no different than anything that nature has made. And we are in the forest. We are in nature. So she's pulling from her surroundings. Odds my little life. God save my little life. But they couldn't say God back then on stage. So odds my little life. I think she means to tangle my eyes too. This I love. I love, I love. This visual back then was that when you were in love, you had beams that that kind of shot out of your eyes at another person. And those beams from one person and the beams from other tangled up and connected when they were in love with each other. I know, right? No, faith, proud mistress. So mistress, not good. <laughs> proud mistress, hope not after it. No, 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 no. Do not hope it, not gonna happen. Don't like you, you're ugly. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream. Okay, color, color, color. So black back then, meaning ugly, dark, definitely racist. We are not in that time anymore, so figure out your way to go about that. I think it's just going against the color being the thing and just being these intense eyebrows, your your silky, oily black hair, your bugle eyeballs, those are like black little beads. So like she had two little black beads, nor your cheek of cream, which sounds nice, but no, <laughs> it's kind of like, I don't know, a, a white curtain or a cream colored curtain that's gotten yellow over time. It's kind of, uh, the cheeks have gotten kind of old and decrepit is kind of how I think of it, which, um, is hysterical um, that she says that. That can entame my spirits to your worship. Shift focus. You foolish shepherd. Wherefore, oh, why do you follow her? Foggy south puffing with wind and rain. Rain being the tears, wind being his air, his breath. As and as he speaks, that hot air that's coming out <laughs> to build her up. You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. Okay, you got it going on. She does not. Tis such fools 
as you that makes the world full of ill-favored children. One of my favorites, one of my favorites. It's idiots like you who build up these ugly, mean women <laughs> makes the world full of little ugly children. <laughs> it's terrible, but very funny. Tis not her glass, but you that flatters her. No, it's not about her perspective. It's about your perspective. You looking at her that flatters her. And out of you, she sees herself more proper because you're building her up than any of her lineaments can show her. Anything that she has that actually is beautiful or great or wonderful or anything like that, she doesn't have any. Man, Rosalind, see, she's like going, she is, she's being rude and mean and going crazy on her. There is something else other than Rosalind is a person who comes upon this and walks in and starts spouting everything. Energized out of her own experience and how she's connecting to these other new people as she meets them and watches them and sees things unfold. And her being so free as Ganymede to, to express herself more now. Shift focus again, back to Phoebe. But mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees and thank heaven. <laughs> Fasting for a good man's love. Okay, this is another one of my favorites. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. <laughs> That's fantastic. Everybody knows this part. I mean, people who know this play, they know this line is coming. But she is like, this is what you need to do. Settle right now. Like, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. <laughs> you are nothing special whatsoever. Woo! Man, Rosalind. Cry the man mercy. Love him. Take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. Ugly is the most ugly when you're a scorner, because that's ugly, plus being ugly already is the most ugly you can be. That's what you're being. So take her to the shepherd, fare you well. And I mean, there's different things to play with, but at least make a choice and have it go somewhere so that this entire monologue just doesn't stay in one or two levels. There's so many other little pieces to play with here. That is the monologue. Thank you so much. And why, I pray you, who might be your mother that you insult, exalt, and all at once over the wretched? What though you have no beauty, as by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed, must you therefore be proud and pitiless? Why, what means this? Why do you look on me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. Odds, my little life. I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entame my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd. Wherefore do you follow her like foggy south puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. Tis such fools as you that make the world full of ill-favored children. Tis not her glass, but you that flatters her. And out of you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees and thank heaven fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you friendly in your ear. Sell when you can. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy. Love him. Take his offer. Foul is most foul being foul to be a scoffer. So take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well.